For those of you who don't know me, my name is Greg. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about fiber to the home. Uh, I did do this presentation on a fly, so I took a previous one I had made and I kind of hacked it together, which is why stuff's crossed out. And so, um, yeah, I'm just going to be mostly talking about uh, fiber to the home. I have experience with it, and so I'll be, you know, just chatting about it here. Um, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about how to get fiber to the home in this area, this, that. Uh, we can certainly discuss that, but I'm mostly going to be providing experience, uh, things that I've done, things that I've learned, why it's useful, why people like it, why I like it, and everything like that. So, uh, quick outline, it's not really important here. Um, I am going to talk about myself first, because I think my, I'm kind of interesting. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so, for those of you who don't know me, I am a senior in business information systems. I switched from computer science a couple years ago, and I'm supposed to graduate this spring. And uh, I'm currently what they call a systems developer, which doesn't mean a whole lot. Where I come from, titles are pretty useless. But before that, I was an analyst. Before that, I was a system administrator. And before that, I was an intern, all at the same company. Uh, my hometown is Sandy, Oregon. And my current employer is the city of Sandy. And so, what? Represent. Yeah. For those of you who don't know where Sandy is, it's right there where the red dot is, halfway between Portland and Mount Hood. And Sandy is about 40 minutes from Mount Hood. Uh, it's a small town, about 12,000 residents or so, uh, but only about 3,400 homes. Uh, we are growing pretty fast due to a study that was done last year. 20-year uh, projections are expected to have a lot of growth within the city, which you know we're all kind of excited about. And uh, we, the reason we're so small, we, we were always kind of small, is we used to be a logging town until the endangerment of the spotted owl. And so now we've kind of changed. Portland's rapidly growing, and so the, uh, a lot of them are coming out to here for cheaper housing. And so despite us being small, there's a major highway that runs through Sandia that gets us a lot of traffic uh, every day, which is why our motto is called the Gateway to Mount Hood. And uh, I may be biased here, but I think we do have a pretty great local government. Um, I've kind of been in the mix with it for a number of years, and just the way that we handle things and our kind of approach makes us really resident and business friendly, um, you know, uh, as opposed to like looking at seeing what kind of crap Portland pulls and you see about the news and everything. And we're currently dealing with growing pains. Uh, the amount of employees we have that work within our city is quickly becoming less than ideal. And uh, we're trying to find money to be able to keep up with that demand there. So it'll all balance itself out over time. It's just those are the growing pains right now there. So let's talk about SandyNet. Uh, we're a municipal internet service provider, which means we are owned by the residents of Sandy. And we are considered a public utility. And uh, we're wireless and fiber based as our medium. And in addition, SandyNet is also the IT department for the internal city. So your police department, your operations center, your community center, your library, everything like that is all rolled into uh, what we call SandyNet. We're all kind of just referred to it as there. We currently have seven employees, and we kind of pride ourselves on having uh, superior customer support. And uh, the history behind SandyNet is that back in 2003, if you can remember back to that date, uh, uh, dial-up was starting to kind of go away and DSL was coming into play and becoming a huge player. And so what happened is City Hall tried to get DSL. And when they called the phone company to get a DSL line, they said, we don't provide DSL anywhere in Sandy. And they said, well, if, if the city can't get internet, that means our residents can't get it. And how is that going to hurt the city in the future if they can't get internet? Because we see internet as something that's going to be growing. Uh, large and we need our residents to be able to get it at faster speeds. And so they created, uh, the city manager said, let's create our own internet service provider and we called it SandyNet, which is why it's kind of got that archaic name. And we were mostly wireless based at first. We were a bunch of, they had a bunch of contractors in there. Uh, then they replaced it with one guy that graduated high school that was an intern. He left, hired my current boss, brought me on as an intern and then we grew employees from there. And so I've been there since 2009. And so, a couple years later after that, we started our major wireless expansion, which basically was to cover the whole city with wireless access points. We had a Cisco mesh network with a combination of a bunch of ubiquity Chinese uh, devices. They were fairly cheap, and that's kind of why we got them, because we're always cheap. And uh, we provided internet access throughout the whole city from streetlights that would jump off each other back to our central office. And wireless backhaul then? Yeah. Okay. It was, uh, at one point, we had some neighborhoods that were off 10 backhaul hops to get back to the central office. They didn't get a whole lot of speed. <laughs> but at least they had free wireless. Yeah, oh, no, we, we charged oh, them. We charged so they had, uh, they had units on their house that would point back to the access points that gotcha. would then hop back and forth. And so this is a paid service. But we were the cheapest internet provider in Sandy. 
uh, and uh, we still are. And they uh, and it was comparable speeds at the time to, uh, compared to DSL and possibly even the cable company at the time. So we were able to complete compete for cheaper prices, and we had really cheap hardware that could be replaced or put up in a matter of minutes rather than months that it took to do construction. So, but as time grew on, uh, remember this is about when Netflix really caught on their, their web streaming service. Uh, we saw an increase in traffic and we saw a major increase in customers. We went from, when I started, we had about 300 to our peak, we had about 1,600 or so. Remember there's only 3,400 homes. So we had roughly half the city on our Wi-Fi network. And with that, a lot of radios and a lot of customers and a lot of traffic, turns out you can destroy the Wi-Fi spectrum <laughs> in an area, which uh, meant every time we added a customer, everyone else would slow down, even all their providers with their Wi-Fi. So it was, uh, it was starting to get pretty bad. We saw it as, this is, this is doomsday. It's, it's just gonna happen someday. It's just, this is gonna be bad. And so we started looking at other options and we looked at fiber back in 2012. We knew nothing about fiber. We're a bunch of network guys. We're a bunch of system administrators just learning this stuff and doing it. Uh, you know, we didn't have any telecom experience. We'd never done fiber deployment before, but so we started going to conferences. We started talking to people. We started trying to get information on this here. And he said, we can do this ourselves. That's why it failed in 2012, as we didn't know enough. We couldn't get a high enough take rate. We tried doing a pilot project. We couldn't, we couldn't get people interested in it, or we just didn't know how to do it there. So we said, let's go back to the drawing board, scrap it. We'll come back in a year. So we did that. In 2013, we looked at a company called i3 America, which is a fiber com a company that deploys fiber networks, and then they hand the keys over after a certain number of years. So they build it, let you manage it, and then you, after you pay them back, they give the keys to you, and they give you ownership to the network. He said, okay, that sounds pretty cool. And they had some secret sauce that uh, they said that they could uh, deploy fiber lines through sewers, which allowed us to decrease our construction costs and not having to bore through the streets underneath the ground. I don't know how it worked. Apparently it worked. So we got a contract signed with them and uh, then they stopped talking to us for about a month. They didn't respond to emails. We, you know, we, we get in the, trying to get the money allocated to get to them so we could start this thing and they weren't talking to us. When they finally decided to start talking to us, they said, hey, we've been bought out. This company no longer exists. It's called Sci-Fi Networks now. And they said, your old contract, we're not honoring it, which means you need to sign this new one. And there were some changes to it. And one of the biggest changes was they said, we retain ownership of your network and have the ability to sell it to anybody we want as long as it's owned by us. And we said, we don't like that. <laughs> we don't want our network that we paid money for and we're paying back to be sold off to another company at any given point in time. And so we, we said, we're not signing that. Project fell through and we went with someone else that had a, com uh, a competitive quote called OFS and uh, they were doing a traditional build for actually even cheaper. And so we went with them. So that was our second fiber attempt, and the OFS came into the picture right about here or so, and we got a contract signed with them, everything was good, we started building, we got construction, which brings up, us up to about today, where we actually, uh, a couple months ago, just started deploying our business fiber district. And that is, if you look at the map here, this is Sandy, sorry if you can't see it too well. I can try to make it a little easier here. Our business district is right about here, so. So we had residential fiber. This is all of our conduit paths throughout the whole city there. There's a 60 miles of fiber in the ground or so that we've put in in the course of a year during this project. And uh, we are now deploying the business district so we can take more of that market from businesses now, which is still technically going to our competitors. How did you uh, run your fiber? Did you dig your own trenches then? Or? Yeah, it was all drilled in, direct bury, open trench. It was, it's all underground. We have nothing that's aerial. We don't own any poles. We didn't want to pay for that. And plus, we're also where there's a bunch of trees and windstorms. We didn't want to have to yeah. deal with broken poles. So the build out itself started in 2014. Uh, cost about $8 million. Like I said, we contracted out to a company called OFS, which, uh, which was our professional services, which did the build out, the design, and the partial turn up. And then it was a turnkey operation, so they handed us the keys when they were done. And we're all sitting back thinking this is great, you know, and then things started coming together and we're like, we need to, we need to figure out how to run this thing because it's being built and we don't know how to run a fiber network still. And so we started looking around, we started trying to get as much information as possible, but it turns out, and the private sector, that's, 
secret information. <laughs> they don't like to hand out how they operate or how to do things. And there's no real documentation on it that's really easily accessible. And so we learn things on our own. You know, I, I, don't, I, I like to say we're all kind of smart guys. We can figure it out. And so we started coming up with our own processes, our own documentation, our own way of doing things. And we built our network our way, which was kind of cool because now we have companies and our vendors come to us and say, when someone else is trying to do a fiber network, says, you got to go talk to the city because they did this completely different than anyone else that does it. And uh, we were just like, we're just doing what we thought was right. <laughs> and it turns out it works for us here because we have, uh, I'll show you the graphs here in, the, in a bit here, but we're actually doing pretty well here. So um, like I said, I made this for a business, uh, a business presentation at first. So there's a lot of stuff about processes and business, uh, you know, systems and everything like that there. So I'll skip over that. So our competition, there's three providers in Sandy. We have us, SandyNet, we have Wave Broadband, which is a cable company, which would be Comcast down here, which is a cable provider. And then we have our, our uh, tele, uh, Teleco, which is Frontier, and uh, down here at CenturyLink. So phone line, cable company, and we're just strictly internet. And so they can all kind of, we can all provide the same services, it's just our medium and how we get to the customer is different, which separates us uh, on what type of company we are. So just to show you, SandyNet has never been owned by anybody else. We've always been owned by the city. Wave Broadband is now the current owner. It was Charter, and then before that it was owned by Falcon. So we're talking 30 plus years of infrastructure in the ground. It's getting pretty old. We're talking, and then we got Frontier, which is the teleco, the phone company, DSL, uh, was Verizon before they sold off that portion. And before that was GTE, which I think built it out. And then you, everyone knows GTE was Bell at one point. So, you know, they, a lot of these companies have been bought out over time. And so they inherit this old ancient infrastructure and we just kind of have our own there. So when you look at the graph here, pretty simple. Uh, there's three companies. We have two thirds of the market, so we're not doing bad. <laughs> and so uh, I will talk a little bit about our mission here. Uh, we're, like I said, I like to say we're not quite your typical internet service provider. We are owned by the public. Uh, we always have low prices, and I'll show our, our price tiers here in a little bit here. And our, our philosophy is kind of leaving money on the table here because we are local government. We're here. To, our job is technically to represent citizens. We're not here to make a profit necessarily, which is, means we don't hike up the prices for speeds. We don't, we don't try to gouge the customer in any way because we did a study, and it, it was proven that if you can save money for a customer, every dollar that's spent within your city, at least for our size here, gets spent seven more times before it leaves that city there. So we said if we can save the customer 20 bucks a month or something like that on internet, that's 20 more dollars that can be reinvested into the city seven times before it leaves. And that causes economic development within the city, which is what we want to do. And so that's kind of our, it's that cash cycle that we're talking about there. And also we have, we have I'd say we have better customer support. Um, than uh, a lot of other companies. We're all local, we answer the phone, we do email, we'll do it over Facebook. We, you know, we all kind of go over Facebook and the little groups that are open for small towns and we help customers that have issues over Facebook. It's just kind of the way we operate. So that's our team there. I know all these guys personally, they're all buddies of mine. Uh, there's one guy down there, he's actually probably one of my best friends. I've known him since a kid and I asked him to come work with us to do installs and stuff and so he's been doing that since then. So we kind of all know each other, we all are small and everything like that, so it's kind of cool. So our service tiers here, our lowest plan is 300 megabit synchronous, up and down, for 40 bucks a month. So uh, it's not bad. <laughs> this is residential. Service. This is residential service. So yeah, this is, uh, um, yeah, uh, we, it was 100 megabits, but uh, Wave Broadband, I put here, put 250. It's not possible technically because they oversaturate their network, but their highest tier plan is 250. And at the time when they announced that ours was 100 megabits for 40 bucks a month, and I said, it costs us nothing. Let's just make our lowest plan higher than their fastest plan. And so we did that on the 4th of July, we upped everybody and put up this whole promotion about it. And they, they didn't like that, but it said it costs us nothing. So let's just say, thanks for being a customer. Here's 200 extra megabits a second for free. And, uh, and so we do offer gig for the people that want bragging rights. I don't know of anyone that uses it fully. I don't think really you can right now <laughs> for a residential, but you know, we have that option available there because you can't put all your eggs in one basket and have one service tier. So we have two. Uh, one thing we do, we do not do is we don't have data caps. I don't know if Comcast has a data cap. I think they inject HTML into my websites and say, hey, you've used 90% of your data for the month. I'm like, oh, didn't know we had such a thing. So yeah, thanks. And so uh, we don't have data caps. We also manage Wi-Fi for free because, like I said, it costs us next to nothing, and that adds to our support. When someone calls and has an issue saying, I need help with my Wi-Fi, 
we can just remote into their device and we can help them out with you know, whatever they need. Uh, we, have a, we have a system in place that allows to basically seamlessly tie into a customer and just gain access to their router to be able to help them out and stuff. And then uh, the downside is because we're so cheap, we have limited weekend support because, like I said, we got seven guys running this thing. And so we work nine to five, Monday through Friday, <laughs> nine to six, sometimes. And so uh, we, don't, uh, uh, we don't offer weekend support sometimes. You know, there's no technical on-call schedule. We're kind of all doing this as it goes. And most of the time, it's fine. When there's a big outage or something like that, then we step up and we take care of issues. But if someone's like, hey, I can't get my Wi-Fi connected, said, just wait till Monday. Come on. <laughs> So, uh, this, was, uh, this has to do with business process reengineering, which uh, is kind of boring. I don't want to talk about too much here. But basically, when we, this is back, goes back to when we were building it out. Uh, we had this old customer record system that was written in PHP by one of my coworkers to solve a need of being able to get away from an Excel document that had all of our customers in it. And uh, <laughs> you know, when, we, when I came on, we had, yeah, <laughs> we had about 300 customers or so, and it was manageable, but wasn't great. So it was a basic database with a, a web front end, and it did what it needed to do. Then it was built for wireless, so which means it couldn't do fiber very well. And so uh, when we tried to make it work with fiber, things didn't work out very well. And so it, it didn't transition well. And so uh, we had a lot of issues with customers that weren't getting installed that should have been. Stuff was being lost when it was tracked. We couldn't track information. Uh, it's just, it was kind of a mess there. And so down here, uh, when I was down here at school, I was bored sitting at my desk because I telecommute when I'm down here. I said, is there anything I can do to make this better? And so I went to, I went, and I was in business now at this point, and so I said, okay, let's try to redesign some of the process and the way we've done things. And so uh, I did a, I, t I really enjoyed my process management classes, my operations management classes, and how to make things more efficient and lean. And uh, we started implementing that and leveraging it with software. The only downside was I needed people to use the software for it to actually work. And so that's its own, that's hard to do when you're down here, you know, but you can write the greatest stuff in the world that takes care of everything, but it's useless unless someone actually uses it right. And so I worked on making this, uh, uh, on trying to make these things to make people's lives easier. And over time, people started integrating it. And we kind of changed the, the culture of our company, which was really cool to see because we're a lot more lean and better that, than we were before. So it eliminated busy work, busy work. It restored our, our image that was slipping. Uh, we weren't losing data anymore. Uh, we didn't have post-it notes flying between cubicles. <laughs> we, uh, there wasn't just emails, text messages, you know, everything, you know, talking to someone. It was all done through the centralized system now. And so it, 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 it made things a lot easier. And, that, and once, this, once this started getting integrated, we started seeing the response rate and our image start to grow again and now since then, uh, we've been able to maintain that, and so it's been, it's been great to know. And we also gained industry knowledge. We built the system around what we had learned, that custom system, in ways that we had done things. We built our software to do that with that. And so we kind of just had this whole, uh, our own way of doing things, and we're kind of very different than other people there. And so, yeah, like I said, I talked about it over time here. Uh, decreased miscommunication and everything like that there. Um, this doesn't make much sense here. So you know, all know as an ISP, uh, an ISP has uh, uh, basic functions. Every ISP has to be able to do this here. They have to be able to build out service, provide their customers with internet. They have to be able to maintain that service, otherwise they're gonna go up, go belly up because they don't have customers. Uh, they have to comply to regulatory laws such as DMCA, and they gotta make sure they're getting money, so they have to have a billing system of some sort. And these are the basic things that ISPs have to do. Um, but then if you choose to, you can go beyond that and add more value to your customers and support, which is something that we, we started doing once we started redoing our processes here. And so we started supporting past the DMARC point. We started managing people's Wi-Fi for free. We started expanding into areas that other people wouldn't go because they didn't see a point in doing it because that's, that's, that's up for grabs. That's free, you know, that's free customers right there. You're not competing for that because no one else is out there. And, uh, and then we add processes that add value to customers there. Um, and then now at this point, um, what I wrote that manages all this stuff is called the FMS. And so uh, it's called the driver. So you start out as, as a basic utility, you become lever, something that does something else, that leads to something else, you become a driver. So uh, we can't do this a whole lot as, as, a, as an ISP, but some companies kind of take on uh, innovation and start creating, you know, creating trends and other things that people hop onto and everything. That's kind of what driver is supposed to be. And so what we've done is we said, hey, this program can work can we give it to other people and see if it works also? And so we've, uh, we've sold a couple copies to other people that are doing deployments and uh, that's, I just put it underneath there. 
And so, you know, we're still there to serve residents, but now we have the mindset of saying, don't get comfortable. Keep redoing everything you do. Try to make it better. Try to, try to always push, you know, see how much more value you can add to your customers for free. Because it turns out when you think that way, you find ways that you can save the company money because if you can use like software to leverage your operations more, you, can, you don't have to hire another body to do work. And that decreases miscommunication. And uh, there's just there's a whole bunch of things that happen because of that there. So here's some operations here. We're small, which means I get to do everything. <laughs> so this is our new data center here that we built from the ground up, which was awesome because our old one was really terrible. <laughs> and so uh, was, uh, you know, when we were doing the fiber project for $8 million, we said, here's a portion of that check that's for data center stuff. Get, tell me what you want, we'll buy it, we'll put it together. So I got to build this data center from the ground up, installing the racks, putting the cables in, and everything like that. And that was really fun. I've always liked walking into a clean data center and being like, this is nice. They actually really took the time to build this, and that's just something I like to do. I was get to climb towers to deal with our radio equipment. That was from a couple weeks ago. It was kind of fun. And then we do our own construction now. We've insourced most of our operations. And yes, I have a hot dog suit on. Don't ask why. <laughs> but <laughs> I lost a bet. And so <laughs> we have this directional drilling machine, which allows us to basically drill underneath roads, turn ahead. We can, we can drill underneath the ground and turn it wherever we want and then pull cable back. And so this allows us to go into existing neighborhoods that don't, didn't have fiber and be able to put it in the ground. Uh, it's very expensive. That was about $100,000 right there for that, that machine there. But it's pretty fun to work with. And so if I'm having a bad day, I don't want to write code, I want to answer phones, I can be like, hey, need some help outside? Need someone to come out and dig? And I can go take my, my anger out on the ground <laughs> and go out and dig. So it's kind of cool being able to do that. So yeah. Um, some of you might know these, some, this, these systems and equipment. We use a lot of Cisco Ubiquity stuff. Microtik because it was fairly cheap. Calyx is quickly becoming a really good company that I'd like to work for. I think they're doing really cool stuff in the fiber industry uh, with PON, GPON, uh, coming out with NGPON2 stuff, uh, GFAST for providing gigabit speeds over two pairs of phone lines. We're deploying that for our, our, our apartments complexes right now. We're using GFAST equipment. We bring fiber up to the side of the building and we use the existing CAT3 cable in the building to provide up to uh, 300 megabits synchronous sometimes higher, depending on how far, because DSL is, is distance based. Uh, this is one thing I wrote here. This is a flow chart I made for my boss when he was a, at a presentation for Calyx in, in Vegas. Basically, we have service techs that have mobile devices out in the field, anywhere else. Uh, we have our FMS software, which talks to their cloud-based software called Compass, which can then talk to this, their customer premise equipment. So this is called an 844E. This is the customer equipment that sits in the house. It's got Wi-Fi, it's got, you know, it's got everything you need in it, it's pretty cutting edge. You know, we have people that can get 600 plus megabits a second on 5.8 gigahertz network on their phones, which is pretty cool for a wireless device that I don't think your phone could ever use that much, but hey, you can do it. And so they all talk to their, their, compass, equi you know, their compass suite, and so basically our installers can install the equipment, pull out their phone, configure the Wi-Fi before the unit's even turned on, and when the unit turns on, checks in, does its auto configuration through our system, it then grabs the Wi-Fi configuration and their Wi-Fi setup and their devices connect. So we never pull out a computer when we set up Wi-Fi, we never have to do any of this stuff there. It makes it really fast and easy to do, which is just one thing that we do that saves us time so we don't have to hire somebody else. So, which brings us kind of to where we are now. Uh, we're building out new neighborhoods, because like I said, Sandy is growing pretty fast, or it's supposed to, and so there's a lot of new developments that halted in about 2008 that are now picking up again. And so there's a lot of potential customers uh, and houses being built that we could serve. And so we're building up to those neighborhoods now. Uh, we're catching up on drops to houses. So a drop is going from that main line that I showed you on that map up to the side of the house because it's all underground, it's all glass. And so it's all, we have to drill that in too. And so that's probably the most expensive part of getting a customer hooked up because that costs us about Four hundred to eight hundred dollars to do a do an install for a customer. So each new customer costs us that much, and we charge forty bucks a month. It takes us a little bit of time to get that money back, and so that's where we try to keep them on with good customer support and everything like that. And so far, it's been pretty successful. But uh, and then we, we we continue to try to leverage our workload with uh, with software. Uh, the future is we plan on building out into the more rural areas where the only option is is dial up or satellite. And then uh, we're planning on expanding to other cities. I don't know how much I can talk about this, but I'm working on another deployment up in government camp right now, which is up on Mount Hood, so it's not super far away, but we're planning on doing fiber there also, and we're working on that. 
So it, we can, I, I kind of like this area, and I think that'd be kind of cool to be able to keep up going out and building cities and everything. And uh, we, we want to be able to continue off, uh, to offer different services to customers, such as home automation and security, and hopefully continue selling the, the stuff I've written to help do fiber networks, because it's a great, I think it's a really cool thing, and I think it's going to be coming, it's, it should be coming up a lot more. It should be bigger than it is now, but hopefully it'll catch on, and we'll start seeing fiber popping up all, in a lot of places across the United States. So that's all I have, so thank you for sitting through this. I don't know how much time I have, but I can answer any questions if you guys have them. I can try. Do you have any um, measurements on what your like, uptime is? My uptime? Is there a um, we've had a couple of outages, mostly due to software bugs. Sure. But um, I would say we're, we're, we're up there. Uh, we're more reliable than any other provider out there right now, I can tell you that much. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, Comcast, it's not 99.9. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, what, uh, what, what I've written here is we can predict outages before oh. they occur sometimes, yeah. or when they do occur, we know within 60 seconds how many people, exactly how many people are affected and where they are, and we can target them individually, or we can figure out exactly where the cut is without even doing a truck roll. Sure. We can determine is it software base, is it, is it hardware in the data center, is a line cut somewhere, did someone knock over a, a ped somewhere that's feeding these customers? We have that all documented, sure. and so our system can basically tell us, here's how many people are offline, here's where they're from, here's all the information you could possibly ever want, you figure it out, and then we can, we can just look at it and say, okay, I know where it is, we can go out there and fix it. So sometimes we can resolve issues that bring hundreds of customers back online from a neighborhood without getting a single phone call because they didn't even notice their internet was down because we were able to resolve it fast enough. So it's been kind of cool to be able to do something like that. So I don't have an exact number because I don't, I'm sure I could, I could dig it up somewhere, but I would say we're up there in the 99.9, .9, you know, five maybe, I don't know. <laughs> What's your bandwidth to the internet? Uh, we have 30 gigs through redundant pass right now. We're all going into Portland right now, so yeah. just imagine when that earthquake hits, we're all going to be down because 50% of <laughs> internet traffic in Oregon passes through Portland. But uh, um, we're looking to get path down to Colorado or Salt Lake or something to get a redundant path. But we have, we have multiple people going around. There's a county fiber, which was a, a federal grant for doing fiber for all the schools and municipalities and buildings out there. And so we, we hop on that. Uh, we also get on the school district's network, and we have some of, our, some of the other paths to get us out to Portland. So we have 30 gigabits uh, outbound, and we only utilize five or so across everyone in our, our, our company.